I absolutely hate being idle, so I have to find things to do. And last night was really cold, so we um, it's too, too cold to mix uh, mortar for my stonework on the forge. So I decided to take today, and um, I promised a couple of shooting bags to two good friends of mine. So I'm in the process of making them today. I've got that one pretty much done, uh, and I've got all the parts here cut out for the next one. But before I get into that, I thought I'd show, um, well, first of all, other shooting bags and, and different influences, if, if you would. So this fine bag is made by Jeff Lou down there in the States, and um, that's obviously a European influence, and he's tooled in the word liberty on that, which that, that struck my struck a, a chord with me. So I, I got that bag from Jeff, and um, uh, I'm gonna show what's in it in a minute, but um, so European influence, native influence. So this one's made from brain tan deer hide. Uh, and the major difference, pretty much the same size, but uh, this one doesn't have a flap. They, they didn't prefer a flap for the most part. So uh, when I go hunting, um, there's some things I have to carry aside from the shooting bag. So uh, my powder horn, obviously, uh, and I generally with the smooth bore use 2F powder. And if I'm hunting birds, I'll carry my shot pouch. And it's got uh, the powder measure and the, the uh, shot measure, which will throw an ounce and five eighths of uh, number five shot. So that's if I'm hunting uh, birds, uh, rabbits, squirrels. But what's in the bag? So at a glance, you'd think that bag's pretty impractical. It's too darn small. Well, traditionally, if we look at existing pieces, they were small. They didn't carry things they didn't need. So. Um, maybe before I take a peek inside that, we'll look at what I would carry in a multi-day track, because inside here is everything I'd need for two or three days in the field. But if I was going to go on a multi-day track, there's some things that I can't get in that bag that I would take along with me in a bigger haversack. So I would take a small tin of rendered down bear fat, and I use that for all the lubricants, the inside of the lock, the inside of the barrel, the outside of the gun, and even the wood. Just keep rooting around in here. Sometimes they carry a bullet board, and that one was made by my good friend Bob Miller, and he's a luthier. He, he built some amazing instruments, but he carved that out for me, and it's got some nice tooling of um, floral pattern and leaves in it. And I would carry a, a small folding ladle that I made for um, making more bullets in the field, and also a small bar of lead. Uh, we'd also have my bullet mold for forming the balls, running balls, as they say. I also carry the three springs in a musket. So I carry the frizzen spring, the, the uh, main spring, and the shear spring. And I carry a, a, a spring tool if I have to do those kind of major repairs. So that's multi-day treks. But if I'm going out, as I said, for just a, for a day or two, this is what I carry in this shooting bag. So I always carry a compass, and I have that right handy. In this bag, I have some tow, linen, off the scrapings from the linen floor, and I use that for cleaning the musket. Uh, my powder measure for this, for my round ball, so I'm th this one throws 80 grains of 2F black powder, and I call it my bumblebee. <laughs> Powder, or I decided to paint some yellow bumblebee stripes on that guy. And it's on a thong, so when I'm loading in the field, I, I don't want to risk losing that. So if I want consistent um, shooting, I have to consistent shots. So that's on a thong, so if I drop it, it's just going to hang from the bag. I carry my bullet bag, which is made from braid tanned deer hide, tanned with walnut shells. And inside it are, get one to come out here. I think I got them stuck. There we go. You know they want to come out multiple times, but so my 62 caliber uh, round lead balls. I carry a little tool wallet or flint wallet, if you would. I think they were called more commonly referred to. And inside it, I have a, a small pair of pliers. Now this is for for more major work. I would need those pliers, but I've got three spare flints. Uh, I have my turn screw. I have my worm and bullet puller. And that allows me to do the maintenance and the cleaning of the musket when I'm in the field. Uh, I always have my flint and steel. Sometimes I'll carry a second flint and steel in the haversack. 
just to make sure that uh, if I lose one, I'm able to make fire. I carry a small roll of pillow ticking um, of the right thickness that I use for um, uh, patching the round balls. And I carry a, inside this bag, I've got a permeated piece of cloth with bear fat that I use for wiping the musket down. And that's it. Everything you, everything one would ever need to, to go for a hunt and, and both feed and maintain that, that flintlock musket. So I'm gonna get everything off my bench here and um, we'll show you how I make a, a re, or recreate, if you would, um, a 18th century shooting bag. And I'm no Jeff Luke, but eh, if I say if they can't find it fancy, you should at least find it functional and, and they're gonna work for that. So I'm gonna get this stuff cleaned off. So if we look at some of the finer details um, of the parts, if you would, that are involved in the bag. You'll notice on the back of Jeff's bag here, we've got this stitching. So inside the bag, um, he's done some fine pillow ticking on the, on the flap, which was typically done. Uh, he's sewn a small pocket in there. And I, I had this friend who said, well, well, that pocket, those little pockets they sew in those shooting bags, they're useless. And he used to just throw all this stuff in the bag loose till one day he reached in and gouged his hand on a flint. It was quite a nasty wound. Um, so yeah, you can put certain things in that pouch. Now I like to carry, um, as I said, my compass in there and my flint and steel. So I know right where they are and all my other shooting accoutrements are, are in, in the bag itself. So like I said, I've tried to recreate Jeff's bag. Um, on this one I finished, I've sewn uh, a piece of brain tan deer hide on the part that will wear a lot, your hand going in and out. But it's made from, um, a vegetable tan cowhide. And one of the things you'll saw me at the start where I'm kind of working it is you have to kind of break this hide in. It's like a, a piece of wood when you first start. So the first thing you do once you've got your design that you like and you've cut out your pieces. So there's the, there's the uh, strap that's gonna go on that bag. And I've recreated the same style of a buckle. And now I have an example over here of of buckle here. Now, Bull Beckett, blacksmith and good friend of mine, he made those buckles and, and they're fine examples of what they would have used and worn in the 17 and 1800s. So that's the short strap and typically that buckle was worn on the back so it didn't catch things like your uh, powder measures and things that you'd be wearing on the front of, your, of yourself as you were hunting. So we've got a buckle on the back strap. We put a welt in it between the leather and that gives it its strength. So as far as parts, we've got the back, we've got the front, we've got the flap, and we've got basically it's the hinge um, with a bit of a decorative mold to it um, that will be sewn both to the back portion in terms of if I put them the right way around, it's sewn here, and then it's sewn onto the flap itself underneath. And that'll give the flap that covers the front of the bag. And the welt, the welt I'm gonna stitch uh, around it like this between the two. And it does give it a lot of extra strength. And I'm gonna be using waxed linen for the thread, which would have been typically done. Um, so I've, I've spent hours, I have literally hours, breaking this hide in to make it soft. So the process is I'm gonna sew the bag inside out. And once I get get it all finished, then I've got to turn the bag right side out, <laughs> right side, inside out from right side, anyway, something like that. And it's not easy to do. Um, uh, this bag here took me about 15 minutes. I had to get a tool. I think I used an ax handle to finally get that thing to flip the right way out. Oh, and there's one other piece here that I seem to be missing. Uh, and that's this gusset that gets sewn in the bottom. Uh, you can see it here in Jeff's bag and his is certainly a little prettier than mine. I, I, my fit isn't quite as good, but what that does is makes the bag a little bit um, bigger in volume, if you would. So I decided on that bag to put the gusset in. On this bag, I'm not going to sew that gusset anyway, so it doesn't matter that I'm missing it. Anyway, I'm gonna start putting this thing together. So I use a, an awl, and, and by the way, I've talked frequently about old tools, but of all the tools I own, and, and I own some fairly complex ones, that's my all-time favorite. I've used that all, and it was gifted to me, but I've used that all for 
It's triangular in shape, uh, probably the last two decades. Anyway, I love that thing. So I put a series of small holes around here. Now, yep, um, and you can see them here. Now, a, a real leather smith, if you would, I don't know what you call them, leather worker, leather maker, they would use a punch and, and they, they would punch those holes in. Um, so, but in on the frontier, they would have had a, something simple like that. They wouldn't have those fancy tools. They'd have a knife for cutting it out and that for making holes. So we're gonna go with that. And what we're doing, as I mentioned, we're gonna sew it inside out. So back goes down. The front is opposite. The welt's going in between. And I've started my punched holes on this side. And so I'm just gonna get a couple started here. I know this isn't the way I'm sure Jeff builds his, but it, it works for me. So we're gonna do a simple um, saddle stitch. So got enough thread to, to go completely around and you're passing those two needles. You're gonna go through the hole or one hole and then you're gonna go back through the same hole. And that way you can tighten it up and keep that a, a real tight uh, fit as you stitch around the entire bag. So we're gonna get the first couple started. It will take me a few minutes and then we'll be off, off and running here. Journey of a thousand miles. So there's the first stitch. So what I want to do is get that so I don't run out of thread on one so one needle. Is get that approximately half and half, just close. That'll work. So on the on the top stitch because it's a wear point, I'm going to go through that twice. So we're going to get the sec. We're going for the second hole, then we're going to go back to that top one, and that gets my needles in the right orientation. Pull that guy through. And then we're going to come back to the top here with this one. So we're going to have what we want is opposing needles, and right now they're not. I'm going to go back through that same hole. And So now I've got to go back to the top again. So I'm going to go back through that top hole, which now is going to give me um, opposing needles. So once I've got that first series of stitches done, I've got one needle on either side of the bag. And now it's simply a matter of going down, going down my entire length. I think way that this is often done is though that welt will go in and they'll put clips all the way around so it's held then punch your holes but I kind of like, kind of like to do it the way it would have been done on the frontier in the time period. Makes me smile when I carry it in the field. So we're going to have our first or our second stitch completely done in a minute and I'll show you how I tension it as I go. So now we have two stitches done and we're able to take that and pull really hard on it and now we're off to the races. Okay, we'll uh, call that a good start. So you can see my stitching there and I'm pretty pleased with how that's turning out. And you can see the welt between the two. Um, so when this is finished, the, the stitching that, that I'm doing now, you won't see. That's gonna get turned inside out. 
and um, so it's going to look like that on the side so that you can see the welt there but you can't see the stitching uh, you will see stitching on the flap uh, I do a double one on the back that's for structural integrity because it's sort of the the hinge point and uh, one on the front of the flap um, that holds it so those those, um, those stitchings you will see I've um just about finished this bag. All I've got to do is put the strap on it and the buckle on it. Uh, this bag I've got completely done. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of pleased with the way it turned out. She's soft, it's dyed, it's finished, it's sewn. I've got the strap on it, um, it's adjustable. A couple of things, uh, the fellow who wanted this bag, or a friend of mine that I'm gifting it to, wanted the buckle on the outside. Um, typically it would go on the back side, but he's right-handed, so he's gonna wear that with the buckle out. Uh, the other thing when I'm making my own aesthetically, we have the smooth side as the first side of the animal. The rough side in the back is the carcass side or the animal side of the animal. So it, it looks pretty when it's done that way, but when I'm sewing my own bags, I tend to put that strap the other way around so that the part that goes over my shoulder is, is the smooth side because when you're wearing a shooting bag and you're wearing a shot pouch and you're wearing a powder horn and you've got a canteen and you've got a bedroll, all these things are going over to your shoulders and around your neck. And it's nice to be able to adjust them while you're, while you're trekking, walking along. So I find with the smooth side in, even though it doesn't look as pretty, it allows that to slide a little easier on my clothing and, and makes for good adjustments. Anyway, I'm gonna finish that strap tonight. I'm burning daylight here. Um, the hunting season's almost upon us, so I'm gonna spend today, uh, I'm gonna go out do a little trekking about uh, and see if I can find some deer sign.